digest this, I chose Rosenberg and uh, Gehring um, to focus on tonight with the closing statement um, by, by Speer. Um, our first scene will be the opening statements and the interrogation of Herman Gehring. The second scene will be uh, the interrogation of uh, Alfred Rosenberg. And then the third scene will be the summation and final statements from each of the three uh, defendants. And we will end um, with, with Albert Speer's statement. Um, so, without further ado. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and to punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hands of vengeance and voluntarily submit to their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power ever has paid to reason. We must never forget the record on which we judge these defendants today is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. To pass these defendants a poisoned chalice is to put our lips to it as well. We would also make clear that we have no purpose to incriminate the whole German people. We know that the Nazi party was not put in power by a majority of German vote. These defendants were men of a station and rank which does not soil its own hands with blood. They were men who knew how to use lesser folk as tools. The most savage and numerous crimes committed by the Nazis were those against the Jews. Of the 9,600,000 Jews who lived in Nazi-dominated Europe, 60% are authoritatively estimated to have perished. History does not record a crime ever perpetrated against so many victims, nor one ever carried out with such calculated cruelty. Undesirables were exterminated by the injection of drugs into the bloodstream, by asphyxiation in gas chambers. They were shot with poison bullets to study the effects. I am one who received during the war most atrocity tales with suspicion and skepticism. But the proof here will be so overwhelming that I venture to predict that not one word I have spoken will be denied. These defendants will only deny personal responsibility or knowledge. The third count of the indictment is based on the definition of war crimes contained in the Charter. It will appear, for example, that the defendant Keitel was informed by official legal advisors that the orders to brand Russian prisoners of war to shackle British prisoners of war and to execute commando prisoners were clear violations of international law. Nevertheless, these orders were put into effect. The fourth count of the indictment is based on crimes against humanity. Chief among these are mass killings of countless human beings in cold blood. Does it take these men by surprise that murder is treated as a crime? 
The first and second counts of the indictment add to these crimes the crime of plotting and waging wars of aggression. The idea that a state, any more than a corporation, commits crimes is a fiction. Crimes always are committed only by persons. The Charter recognizes that one who has committed criminal acts may not take refuge in superior orders, nor in the doctrine that his crimes were acts of state. Uh, by agreement between these pro the prosecutors, it is my task on behalf of the British government and the other states associated in this presentation prosecution to present the case on count two and to show how these defendants in conspiracy with each other and with persons not now before this tribunal planned and waged a war of aggression in breach of the treaty obligations by which under international law Germany as other states had sought to make such wars impossible. Under the General Treaty for the Renunciation of War, 27 August 1928, practically the whole civilized world abolished war as a legally permissible means of enforcing the law or changing it. The right of war was no longer of the essence of sovereignty. Let us see how these defendants ministers and high officers of the Nazi government individually and collectively comported themselves in these matters. On September 1st, 1939, in the early hours of the morning, under manufactured and in any event inadequate pretext, the armed forces of the German Reich invaded Poland along with the whole length of her frontiers and launched and thus launched the war which was to bring down so many of the pillars of our civilization. As early as August 1938, steps were being made to utilize the low countries as defense bases for defect, decisive action in the West in the event of France and England opposing Germany in the aggressive plan on foot, foot against Czechoslovakia. On the 10th of May 1940, at about 0500 hours in the morning, the invasion of Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg began. The only fault of these unhappy countries was that they stood in the path of the German invader in the designs against England and France. But that was enough. On the 6th of April, 1941, German forces invaded Greece and Yugoslavia. On the 22nd of June, 1941, German armed forces invaded Russia without warning, without declaration of war. The Nazi armies were flung against the power with which Hitler had so recently sworn friendship, and Germany embarked upon that last act of aggression in Europe, which after a long and bitter fighting was eventually to result in Germany's own collapse. It is indeed true, as Great Britain fully accepts, that immediately, as state accepts international obligation, it limits its sovereignty. But in that way, and that way alone, lies the future peace of the world. The government of a totalitarian country may be carried on without representatives, representatives of the people. But it cannot be carried on without any assistance at all. It's no use having a leader unless there are also people willing and ready to serve their personal greed and ambition by helping and following him. It is no excuse for a common thief to say, I stole because I was told to steal. For the murderer to plead, I killed because I was asked to kill. And these men are in no different position. 
political loyalty, military obedience are excellent things, but they neither require nor do they justify the commission of patently withered, wicked acts. There comes a point when a man must refuse to answer to his leader if he also is to answer to his conscience. Even the common soldier, even in serving in the ranks of his army, is not called upon to obey illegal orders. If these crimes were in one sense the crimes of Nazi Germany, they are also guilty as the individuals who aided, abetted, and counseled, <coughs> procured and made possible the commission of what was done. Having prepared and carried out the perfidious assault against the freedom-loving nations, fascist Germany turned the war into a system of militarized banditry. The murder of war prisoners, extermination of civilian populations, plunder of occupied territories, and other war crimes were committed as part of a totalitarian lightning war program, blitzkrieg, projected by the fascists. In particular, the terrorism practiced by the fascists on the temporarily occupied Soviet territories reached fabulous proportions and was carried out with fiendish cruelty. We must, said Hitler, pursue a policy of systematic depopulation. If you ask me what I mean by the term depopulation, I would tell you that I understand it to be the complete removal of whole racial groups. And that is what I am going to do. Such is my purpose. The names have already been mentioned here of the concentration camps with their gas chambers. The Germans also carried out mass shootings of Soviet citizens. The mass murders, this arbitrar arbitrary regime of terror, was fully approved by the defendant Rosenberg in a speech in November 1942. Quote, if we are to subjugate all these people, that is, peoples inhabiting the territory of the USSR, then arbitrary <coughs> rule and tyranny will be an extremely suitable form of government. In April 1942, a top secret circular program of the general plenipotentiary for the employment of labor was sent. It noted that it is extremely necessary fully to utilize the human reserves available in occupied Soviet territories. 400,000 to 500,000 selected healthy and strong girls were ordered to be brought to Germany from the eastern territories in order that the burden on the overworked German peasant woman should be noticeably lightened. The German fascist invaders completely or partially destroyed or burnt 1,170 cities and more than 70,000 villages and hamlets. They burnt or destroyed over 6 million buildings and rendered some 25 million persons homeless. Himmler mentioned that it was necessary to cut down the number of Slavs by 30 million. Now, when as a result of the heroic struggle of the Red Army and the Allied forces, Hitlerite Germany is broken and overwhelmed, we have no right to forget the victims who have suffered. May justice be done. I swear by God the Almighty and Omnificent that I will speak the pure truth and will withhold and add nothing. Or do you wish to examine the defendant? When were you born and where? I was born on 12th January, 1893, in Rosenheim, Bavaria. 
view the tribunal a short account of your life <coughs> after the outbreak of the First World War, but briefly, please. Normal education, first tutored at home, then cadet corps, and then an active officer. A few points which are significant with relation to my later development. The position of my father as first governor of Southwest Africa, his connections at that time, especially with two British statesmen, Cecil Rhodes and the elder Chamberlain. Tell the tribunal when and under what circumstances you came to know Hitler. After the collapse in the First World War, I settled down in the neighborhood of Munich. I found out I could hear Hitler speak as he held a meeting every Monday evening. Finally, I saw a man here who had a clear and definite aim. He gave me for the first time a very wonderful and profound explanation of the concept of National Socialism, the uniting of the concept of nationalism on the one hand and socialism on the other, which could prove itself the absolute bearer of socialism as well as nationalism, the nationalism, if I may say so, of the bourgeois world and the socialism of the Marxist world. In the middle of 1932, after numerous elections had taken place, we became the strongest party, and I was elected president of the Reichstag, and thereby took over a definite political task. Then, in January 1933, there were further elections. One must not forget that at this moment, Germany had arrived at the lowest point of her downward development. Eight million unemployed. All programs had failed. No more confidence in the parties. A very strong rise on the part of the revolutionary <coughs> leftist side and political insecurity. In the end, we were the strongest party with 232 seats. At 11 o'clock in the morning of 22nd January 1933, cabinet was formed and Hitler appointed Reich Chancellor. What measures were taken to strengthen Hitler's power? The Fuhrer told me that the simplest thing to do would be to take as example the United States of America, where the head of state is at the same time the head of the government. That he thereby automatically became also the commander-in-chief of the German armed forces followed as a matter of course, according to the Constitution. Did you create the Gestapo and the concentration camps? For the consolidation of power, the first prerequisite was to create, along new lines, that instrument, with, with, that instrument which at all times and in all nations is always the inner political instrument of power, namely the police. There was no Reich police. In order to make clear from the outset that the task of this police was to make the state secure, I called it the secret state police. The concentration camps. When the need for creating order first of all and removing the most dangerous element of disorder directed against us now became evident, I reached the decision to have the communist functionaries and leaders arrested all at once. The party program included two points dealing with the question of the Jews. What was your basic attitude towards this question? The Nuremberg Laws were intended to be about a clear separation of races, and in particular, to do away with the concept of a person of mixed bloods in the future. You said you had been considered the Fuhrer's successor. Where you, in this capacity, included all politics, problems by Hitler? Of course. He informed me of all important political and military problems. You are perhaps aware that you are the only living man who can expound to us the true purposes of the Nazi party and the inner workings of its leadership? I am perfectly aware of that. You, from the very beginning, together with those who were associated with you, intended to overthrow, and later did overthrow, the Weimar Republic? That was, as far as I am concerned, my firm intention. And upon coming to power, you immediately abolished parliamentary government in Germany? 
we found it to be no longer necessary. Also, I should like to emphasize the fact that we were, moreover, the strongest parliamentary procedure was done away with because the various parties were disbanded and forbidden. The people were merely to acknowledge the authority of the Fuhrer. Thus, not the individual persons were to be selected according to the will of the people, but solely the leadership itself. And after you came to power, you regarded it necessary in order to maintain power <coughs> to suppress all opposition parties. We found it necessary not to permit any more opposition, yes. Yeah. And you also held it necessary that you should suppress all individual opposition, lest it should develop into a party of opposition. In so far as opposition seriously hampered our work of building up, this opposition of individual persons was, of course, not tolerated. Now, in order to make sure that you suppressed the parties and individuals also, you found it necessary to have a secret political police to detect opposition? I have already stated that I considered that necessary, similar to the former political police, but on a firmer basis and larger scale. And upon coming to power, you also considered it immediately necessary to establish concentration camps to take care of your incorrigible opponents. The reason for the concentration camps was not because it could be said, here are a, member, a number of people who are opposed to us, and they must be taken into protective custody. Rather, they were set up as an emergency measure against the functionaries of the Communist Party who were attacking us in their thousands and who, since they were taken into protective custody, were not put in prison. But you are explaining as the high authority of this system to men who do not understand it very well. And I, I want to know what was necessary to run the kind of system that you set up in Germany. The concentration camp was one of the things you found immediately necessary upon coming to power, was it not? And you set them up as a matter of necessity as you saw it. That was faultily translated. It went too fast. But I believe I understood the sense of your remarks. You asked me if I considered it necessary to establish concentration camps immediately in order to eliminate opposition. Is that correct? Your answer is yes, I take it. Yes. Protective custody meant that you were taking people into custody who had not committed any crime but who you thought might possibly commit a crime? Yes. People were arrested and taken into protective custody who had not yet committed any crime, but who could be expected to do so if they remained free. Just as similar protective measures are being taken in Germany today on a tremendous scale. Now, it is also a necessity in the kind of state that you had that you have some kind of organization to carry propaganda down to people and to get their reaction form the leadership of it, is it not? The last part of that question has not been intelligibly translated. Well, you had to have organizations to carry out orders, and to carry your propaganda in that kind of state, did you not? The leadership core was there, of course, partly to spread our ideas among the people. Secondly, its purpose was to lead and organize. When it was state necessity to kill somebody, you had to have somebody to do it, did you not? Yes, just as in other states, whether it is called Secret Service or something else, I do not. And the SS organizations of that kind were the organizations that carried out the orders and dealt with people on a physical level, were they not? The SS never received an order to kill anybody, not in my time. Anyhow, I had no influence on it. I know that orders were given for execution, and these were carried out by the police, that is, by a state order. What police? As far as I can recall, through the Gestapo. At any rate, that was the organization that received the order. You see, it was a fight against enemies of the state. The SS carried out all the functions of the camps, did they not? If an SS unit was guarding a camp, and an SS leader happened to be the camp commander, then this unit carried out all the functions. 
As to organization, everybody knew what the Gestapo was, did they not? Yes, everybody knew what the Gestapo was. And what its program was, in general, not in detail? I explained that program clearly. At the very beginning, I described that publicly. And I also spoke publicly of the tasks of the Gestapo, and I even wrote about it for foreign countries. And there was nothing secret about the establishment of a Gestapo as a political police, about the fact that people were taken into protective custody, about the fact that there were concentration camps. Nothing secret about those things, was there? There was at first nothing secret about it at all. As a matter of fact, part of the effectiveness of a secret police and part of the effectiveness of concentration camp penalties is that people do know that there are such agencies, is it not? It is true that everyone knows that if he acts against the state, he will end up in a concentration camp or will be accused of high treason before court according to the degree of his crime. But the original reason for creating the concentration camps was to keep there those people whom we rightfully considered enemies of the state. Now, is that type of government, the government which we have just been describing, the only type of government which you think is necessary to govern Germany? I should not like to say that the basic characteristic of this government and its most essential feature was the immediate setting up of the Gestapo and the concentration camps in order to take care of our op uh, opponents. Over and above that, we had set down as our government program a great many much more important things, and those things were not the basic principles of our government. But all those things were necessary things, as I understood you, for purposes of protection. Yes, these things were necessary because the opponents existed. And I assume that this is the only kind of government that you think can function in Germany under present condi conditions. Under the conditions existing at that time, it was, in my opinion, the only possible form. And it also demonstrated that Germany could be raised in a short time from the depths of misery, poverty, and unemployment to relative prosperity. Now, all this authority of the state was concentrated? Uh, perhaps I'm taking up another subject. You have related to us the manner in which you and others cooperated in concentrating all authority in the German state in the hands of the Fuhrer. Is that right? I was speaking about myself and to what extent I had a part in it. Is there any defendant in the box you know of who did not cooperate toward that end? so far as was possible. That none of the defenders, defendants have opposed or obstructed the Fuhrer in the beginning is clear. By January 1945, there was no way to prevent the war going on as long as Hitler was the head of the German government, was there? As long as Hitler was the Fuhrer of the German people, he alone decided whether the war was to go on. As long as my enemy threatens me and demands absolutely <coughs> unconditional surrender and held out those terrible conditions which had been intimated, I would have continued fighting whatever the circumstances. When you look at the document D728, Exhibit GB282, in this I want you to deal with the sentence in paragraph 6, the administration enlargement, installations, and deterrent tasks in the concentration camps must be destroyed at all costs. Also, the extermination of some families, etc. These files must under no circumstances fall into the hands of the enemy since they are, after all, secret <coughs> orders by the Fuhrer. Now, this paragraph is certainly directed to all administrative level levels <coughs> down to the country leaders of the Nazi party, and it assumes they knew all about the running of concentration camps. Are you telling the tribunal that you, who up to 1943 were the second man in the right, knew nothing about the concentration camps? 
First of all, I want to say that I do not accept this document and that its whole word wording is unknown to me. And that this paragraph seems unusual to me. I did not know anything about what took place and the methods used in the concentration camps until later when I was no longer in charge. Let me remind you of the evidence that has been given before this court that as far as Auschwitz alone is concerned, four million people were exterminated. Do you remember that? Are you telling this tribunal that a minister with your power in the right could remain ignorant that that was going on? These things were kept secret from me. I might add that in my opinion, not even the Fuhrer knew the extent of what was going on. A witness, had you not access to the foreign press, the press department in your ministry, to foreign broadcasts, you see, there is evidence that altogether, when you take the Jews and other people, something like 10 million people have been put to death in cold blood, apart from those killed in battle. Something like 10 million people. Do you say that you never saw or heard from the foreign press in broadcast that this was going on? First of all, the figure 10 million is not established in any way. Secondly, Throughout the war, I did not read the foreign press because I considered it nothing but propaganda. Thirdly, if I had the right to listen to foreign broadcasts, I never did. Simply because I did not want to listen to propaganda. Neither did I listen to home propaganda. The Fuhrer, at any rate, must have had full knowledge of what was happening with regard to concentration camps, the treatment of the Jews, and the treatment of the workers, must he not? The Fuhrer did not know about the details of concentration camps, about atrocities. As far as I know him, I do not believe he was informed. I am not asking about details. I am asking you about the murder of four or five million people. Are you suggesting that nobody in power in Germany except Himmler and perhaps Kaltenbrunner knew about that? I am still of the opinion that the Fuhrer did not know about these figures. Now, witness, you said that Hitler, in your opinion, did not know about or was ignorant about the question of concentration camps and the Jews. I would like you to look at document USSR 170. Now, this is a conference which you had with a number of people. Losa, who was at the conference, says, there are only a few Jews left alive. Tens of thousands have been disposed of. Do you still say in the face of the documents that neither Hitler nor yourself knew that the Jews were being exterminated? This should be understood. From this you cannot conclude that they have been killed. It is not my remark. The Jews were only left in smaller numbers. From this remark you cannot conclude that they were killed. It could also mean that they were removed. I suggest that you make it clear what is meant by there are only a few Jews left alive, whereas tens of thousands have been disposed of. They were still living there. That is how you should understand that. You heard what I read to you about Hitler. Hitler said the Jews must either work or be shot. That was in April 1943. Do you still say that neither Hitler nor you knew of this policy to exterminate the Jews? For the correction of the document. Will you please answer the question? Do you still say that neither Hitler nor you knew of the policy to exterminate the Jews? As far as Hitler is concerned, I have said I do not believe it. As far as I am concerned, I have said that I did not know, even approximately, to what degree this thing took place. You did not know to what degree, but you knew there was a policy that aimed at the extermination of the Jews? No. A policy for emigration, not liquidation of the Jews. I only knew that there had been isolated cases of such perpetrations. Thank you. If I understand you, Defendant Gehring, you said that all the basic decisions concerning foreign, political, and military matters were taken by Hitler alone. Do I understand you rightly? Yes, certainly. After all, he was the Fuhrer. 
Am I to understand that Hitler took these decisions without listening to the opinions of the experts who studied the questions and the intelligence reports on these matters? Depends upon the circumstances. In certain cases, he would ask for data to be submitted to him without the experts knowing the exact reason. 16th September, 1941, is the date of this document, paragraph B of the document. It states that as a general rule, the death of one German soldier must be paid for by the lives of 50 to 100 communists. I am interested in whether this document was unknown to you. Yes, it was. It was not directed to me either. Here again, it merely went to some administrative office. The Air Force had very little to do with such matters. Please tell me, do you know about Himmler's directions, directives given in 1941 about the extermination of 30 million Slavs? Yes. That was not an order, but a speech. In all speeches Himmler made to assistant leaders, he insisted on the strictest secrecy. Consequently, I have no knowledge of this nonsense. You did not know about it. Very well. Tell me, in the German totalitarian state, was there not a governing center which meant Hitler and his immediate entourage in which you acted as deputy? Could Himmler, of his own volition, have issued directives for the extermination of 30 million Slavs without being empowered by Hitler or by you? Himmler gave no order for the extermination of 30 million Slavs. Had Himmler issued such an order de facto, then he would have had to ask the Fuhrer, not me, but the Fuhrer, and the latter would probably have told him at once that it was impossible. I have a few concluding questions to put to you. First of all, <clears throat> regarding the so-called theory of the master race, were you in accord with this principle of the master race and education of the German people in the spirit of it, or were you not in accord with it? I have never expressed my agreement with the theory that one race should be considered a master race superior to the others, but I have emphasized the differences between the races. You can answer this question. Apparently, you do not consider it right. I personally do not consider it right. The next question. You have stated here at the tribunal that you did not agree with Hitler regarding the question of annexation of Czechoslovakia. The Jewish question, the question of war with the Soviet Union, the value of the theory of the master race, and the question of shooting of British airmen who were prisoners of war. How would you explain that Having such serious differences, you still thought it possible to collaborate with Hitler and carry out his policy. All right. I may have had a different opinion from that of my supreme leader. I may also have expressed my opinion clearly. If the supreme leader insists on his opinion and I have sworn allegiance to him, then the discussion comes to an end, just as is the case elsewhere. I do not think I need to elaborate at that point. In other words, you thought it possible, even in spite of these differences, to collaborate with Hitler. I have emphasized it, and I maintain that it is true. My oath does not only hold good in good times, but also in bad times. Although the Fuhrer never threatened me, and never told me that he was afraid for my health. If you thought it possible to cooperate with Hitler, do you recognize that as the second man in Germany, you are responsible for the organizing on a national scale of the murders of millions of innocent people, independently of whether you knew about these facts or not? Tell me briefly, yes or no? No, because I did not know anything about them and did not cause them. If I actually did know about them, I cannot be held. Did not know about them, I cannot be held responsible for. It was your duty to know about these facts. In what way was my duty? Either I know the fact or I do not know it. You can only ask me if I was negligent in failing to obtain knowledge. You ought to know yourself better. 
Millions of Germans knew about the crimes which were being perpetrated, and you did not know about them? Neither did millions of Germans know about them. That is a statement which has in no way been proved. You stated to the tribunal that Hitler's government brought great prosperity to Germany. Are you still sure that this is so? Definitely in the beginning of the war. The collapse was only due to war being lost. I have no more questions. Please give the tribunal your biographical data. I was born on the 12th of January, 1893, in Revel, Estonia. When the German-Russian front lines approached in 1915, the Institute of Technology was evacuated to Moscow, and there I continued my studies. But to the Baltic Germans, notwithstanding their loyalty towards the Russian state, the homeland of German culture was the intellectual home, and the experience I had in Russia strengthened my decision to do everything within my power to help to prevent the political movement in Germany from backsliding into Bolshevism. Now you mentioned Germany as your intellectual home. Will you tell the tribunal through which studies and by which scientists you were influenced in favor of Germany? In addition to my immediate interest in architecture and painting, I had since childhood pursued historical and philosophical studies. Uh, and thus, of course, I, I felt compelled to read Goethe, Herde, Fichte, in order to develop intellectually along those lines. At the same time, I was influenced by the social ideas of Charles Dickens, Carlyle, and Emerson. The tribunal wants you to confine yourself to your own philosophical subjects at all times. How did you come to the National Socialist Party and to Hitler in Munich? In May 1919, the publisher of a journal was visited by a man by the name of Anton Drexler, who introduced himself as the chairman of the newly founded German Labour Party. There, in the autumn of 1919, I also met Hitler. And when did you join Hitler? Well, at the time, I had a serious conversation with Hitler, and on that occasion, I noticed this broad view of the entire European situation. He said that, in his opinion, Europe was at that time going through a social and political crisis. I would like to add that the name National Socialism, I believe, originated in the Sudetenland. And there, the small German Labour Party was founded under the name of National Socialist German Labour Party. He considered that the representation of national interest should not be based on privileges of certain classes, but on the contrary, on a national basis. The demand for national unity and dignified representation on the part of the people was the right attitude. This resulted for Hitler in the device Dr. of... Dr. Toma, would you try to confine the witness to the charges which are against him? In my opinion, we have to devote some time to Rosenberg's train of thought to determine the motives for his actions. But I will now ask him this. Why did you fight against democracy as a matter of international struggle? Mr. President, I would like to say that no one in the prosecution has made any charge against this defendant for what he has thought. I think we are all, as a matter of principle, opposed to prosecuting any man for what he thinks. To my knowledge, the defendant is also accused of fighting democracy, and that is why I believe I should put this question to him. And what is the question? Why he was fighting democracy why national socialism and he himself fought democracy. I don't think that has anything to do with the case. The only question is whether he used national socialism for the purpose of conducting international offenses. To my knowledge, the charge of waging a war of aggression was preferred because it was a war against democracy based on nationalism and militarism. Democracy outside Germany 
not in Germany. Well, then I would like to ask the defendant how he will answer the charge that National Socialism preached a master race. I have never heard the word master race, uh, Herr and Russell, as often as in this courtroom. To my knowledge, I did not mention or use it at all in my writing. I spoke of a master race as mentioned by Homer only once. And I found a quotation from a British author who, in writing about the life of Lord Kitchener, since the Englishman who had conquered the world had proved himself as a creative superman or a heron bench. Uh, now I would like to ask the following question. You believe that the so-called Jewish problem in Europe could only be solved by removing the Jews from the European continent. Now how and why did you arrive at that opinion? I mean to say, how in your opinion would the departure of the last Jew from Europe solve that problem? It seemed to me that after an epoch of generous emancipation in the course of national movements of the 19th century, an essential part of the Jewish nation also remembered its own tradition and its own character and more and more consciously segregated itself from other nations. But my attitude in the political sphere to the Jewish question was due partly to my observations and experience of Jews in Russia, and later to my experience of them in Germany, which especially seemed to confirm the strangeness. Well, Herr Rosenberg, Rosenberg, what do you have to say to the fact that from the First World War, 12,000 Jewish soldiers died at the front? Of course, I was always conscious of the fact that many Jewish German citizens were assimilated into the German environment. But on the whole, this did not involve the entire social and political movement. Prominent Jewish people and the chairman of the Democratic Party suggested three times, quite openly, that in view of the increase in unemployment, Germans should be deported to Africa and to Asia. Now, Herr Rosenberg, you were the official appointed by the Fuhrer for the supervision of the entire spiritual and ideological education in the National Socialist Party. Did you exert any influence on national lawmaking in that capacity? The party chancellery occasionally asked me to define my position with regard to this or that question, but was not obliged to take my view into consideration. Well, witness, did you know anything about concentration camps? Yes. This question, of course, has been put to everybody. And the fact that concentration camps existed became known to me in 1933. But, but I must state that I knew by name only two concentration camps, Oranienburg or Dachau. Did you participate in the evacuation of Jews from Germany? I should perhaps add one thing. I visited no real concentration camp, neither Dachau nor any other one. I once questioned Himmler. It was in 1938 about the concentration camps and told him that one saw in the foreign press all sorts of reports of, of alleged, alleged uh, atrocities which were being committed in them. Himmler said to me, why don't you come to Dachau and take a look at the things for yourself? We have a swimming pool there. We have military, sanitary installations, irreproachable. No objections can be raised. I did not visit them. Because if something improper had been going on, Himmler would probably not have shown it to me. On the other hand, for reasons of good taste, I did not want to go simply to observe people who had been deprived of their liberty. An American chaplain has very kindly given me in myself a church paper from Columbus. I gathered from that that the United States too arrested Jehovah's Witnesses during the war and that until December 1945, 11,000 of them were still detained in camps. I presume that under such conditions, every state would take similar actions against nationalists who refused to do war service in some form or another. And that was my attitude, too. I could not consider him the wrong in this connection. Yesterday, you stated before the tribunal that you did have a discussion with Heimlich Himmler, the SS Reichsführer, about concentration camps 
If I remember correctly, you said that it was sometime in 1938. Is that so? Yes, I, I testified that I discussed the concentration camps with him once. But, but I cannot say with certainty that it was in 1938, as I did not make a note of it. Uh, very good. He suggested that you should go through one or the other of these camps, Dachau or some other camp. Is that so? Yes. He then told me that I should take a look at the Dachau. And you declined the invitation. Right. But if I recollect correctly, I understand you to say that you declined because you're quite sure that he would not show you the unfavorable things that were in that camp. Yes, I assume more or less that if there really were unfavorable things, I certainly would not see them anyway. You mean that you simply assumed that there were unfavorable things, that you didn't know there were unfavorable things? I heard this through the foreign press, and it is, it's about... Uh, when did you first hear that through the foreign press? Uh, that was in the, the month of 1933. And did you continuously read the foreign press about the concentration camps in Germany from 1933 to 1938? I did not read the foreign press at all, for unfortunately I do not speak English. I only received some excerpts from it from time to time. And in the German press, there were occasional references to the allegations in, in the foreign press. And it was emphatically denied that there was any truth in these allegations. I can still remember a statement by Goering in which he said that it was beyond his comprehension that anything like that could be written. Did you ever talk about the extermination of the Jews? I have not in general spoken about the extermination of the Jews in the sense of this term. One has to consider the words. The term extermination has been used by the British Prime Minister. You will refer to the words. You just tell me now whether you ever said it or not. You said that you did not? Not in a single speech in, in that sense. I understand the sense. Did you ever talk about it with anybody as a matter of state policy or party policy about the extermination of the Jews? In a conference with Sophia, there was once an open discussion on this question apropos of an intended speech, which was not delivered. When was it you were going to deliver that speech? Approximately, what was the date? In December 1941. Then you had written into your speech remarks about the extermination of the Jews, hadn't you? Answer that yes or no. I have said already that the word does not have the sense that you attribute to it. I will come to the word and the meaning of it. I am asking you, did you use the word or the term extermination of the Jews in the speech which you prepared to make at the Sports Palace on December of 1941. Now you can answer that pretty simply. That may be, but I do not remember. I myself did not prepare the phrasing of the draft. In which form it was expressed, I can no longer say. Well, then perhaps we can help you on that. <laughs> I will ask you to be shown document 1517 PS. It becomes exhibit USA 824. Now this is a memorandum of yours written by you about the discussion you had with Hitler on 14 December 1941. If you will look at the second paragraph, you will find these words. Quote, I took the standpoint not to speak of the extermination, Ausraton, of the Jews. The Fuhrer affirmed this and said they had thrust the war upon us and they had brought the destruction. It is no wonder if the results would strike them first." End quote. Now you have indicated that you have some difficulty with the meaning of that word and I'm going to ask you to be shown. You are familiar with the standard German English dictionary, Kassels I suppose, are you? Do you know this work? Ever heard of it? No. This is something you will be interested in. Will you look up and read out to the tribunal what the definition of Ausrottung is? I do not need a foreign dictionary in order to explain the various meanings in the German language that the word Ausrottung may, may have. One, one can exterminate an idea, an economic system, a social order, and as a final consequence, also a group of human beings, certainly. Those are many possibilities which are contained in that word. 
For that, I do not need an English-German dictionary. Translations from German into English are so often wrong. For example, in that last document you have submitted to me, I heard again the translation of Herrenrasse. All right, I'm not interested in that. Let's deal with this term on Ausrassen. I take it then you agree it does not mean to wipe out or to kill off, as it is understood, that you did use this term in speaking to Hitler. Here again, I hear a different translation, which again use new German words, so I cannot determine what you wanted to express in English. Are you very serious in pressing this apparent inability of yours to agree with me about this word, or are you trying to kill time? Don't you know there are plenty of people in this courtroom who speak German and who agree that the word does mean to wipe out, to extirpate? It means to overcome in one sense, and then it is used not with respect to individuals, but rather to judicial entities, to certain historical traditions. In another sense, the word has been used with respect to the German people, and we have not believed that it meant that 60 million Germans would be shot. I want to remind you that this speech of yours in which you used the term Aus was about six months after Hitler told Hesse, whom you've heard on this witness stand, to start exterminating Jews. Is that a fact? Is it not? Then may I perhaps say something about the use of the words here. We are speaking here of extermination of Jewry. There's still also a difference between Jewry and individual Jews. It is common to think of our own time as standing at the apex of civilization, from which the deficiencies of preceding ages may patronizingly be viewed in the light of what is assumed to be progress. The reality is that in the long perspective of history, the present century will not hold an admirable position unless its second half is to redeem its first. No half century ever witnessed slaughter on such a scale, such cruelties and inhumanities, such wholesale deportations of people into slavery, such annihilations of minorities. Crimes in the conduct of warfare were planned with thoroughness as a means of ensuring the victory of German arms. I admit that Hitler was the chief villain, but for the defendants to put all the blame on him is neither manly nor true. We know that even the head of a state has the same limits to his senses and to the hours of his day as have lesser men. He must rely on others to be his eyes and ears. For most that goes on in a great empire, other legs must run his errands, other hands must execute his plans. On whom did Hitler rely for such things? more than upon these men in the dock. Who led him to believe he had an invincible air armada, if not Goering? Who fed his illusion of German invincibility, if not Keitel? Who kept his hatred of the Jew inflamed more than Rosenberg? These men had access to Hitler. They were the Praetorian Guard, and while they were under Caesar's orders, Caesar was always in their hands. These defendants now ask this tribunal to say that they are not guilty of planning, executing, or conspiring to commit this long list of crimes and wrongs. They stand before the record of this trial as blood-stained Gloucester stood by the body of his slain king. He begged his widow, as they beg of you, say I slew them not. And the queen replied, then say they were not slain, but dead they are. If you were to say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say there have been no war, there are no slain, 
there has been no crime. I call upon the Chief Prosecutor for the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. That these defendants participated in and are morally guilty of crimes so frightful that the imagination staggers and reels back at their very contemplation, that is not in doubt. In their graves, crying out not for vengeance, but that this shall not happen again, are 10 million people who might be living in peace and happiness at this hour. Soldiers, sailors, airmen, and civilians killed in battles that ought never to have been. Nor was that the only greatest climb, not in battle, not in passion, but in the cold, calculated, deliberate attempt to destroy nations and races, to disintegrate the traditions the institution and the very existence of free and ancient states. Two-thirds of the Jews in Europe are exterminated, more than six million of them, on the killer's own figures. For such crimes, these men might have been preceded against by summary executive actions and had the treatment which they had been parties to meeting out against so millions of innocent people that would have been meted out to them. They could have hardly complained, but the tribunal, this tribunal, is to adjudge their guilt, not on any moral or ethical basis alone, but according to the law. Let them now, accused murderers as they are, attempt to belittle the power and influence they exercised how they will. We only have to recall their ranting as they strutted across the stage of Europe dressed at their brief authority to see the part they played. They did not then tell the German people of the world that they were merely ignorant, powerless puppets of their Fuhrer. The defendant's spear has said, even in a totalitarian system, there must be total responsibility. It's possible after the catastrophe. It is impossible after the catastrophe to evade this total responsibility. If the war had been won, the leaders would have assumed total responsibility. Almost, almost even immediately after the war had started, the organized extermination of the Jewish race began. Hess describes the improvements that he made at Auschwitz. He introduced a new gas, Zyklon B, which took from <coughs> 3 to 15 minutes to kill people in the death chamber, dependent on climatic conditions. We knew, he said, the people were dead because they stopped screaming. The propositions you are asked to accept is that a man who was either, either a minister or a leading executive in a state, which within the space of six years transported in horrible conditions some seven million men, women, and children for labor, exterminated 275,000 of its own aged and mentally infirm, and annihilated in gas chambers or by shooting what must be the lowest computation to be 12 million people remain ignorant, are irresponsible, not responsible for these crimes, you are asked to accept the horrors of the transports, of the conditions of this slave labor deployed as it was in labor camps throughout the country. The smell of burning bodies, all of which were known to the world, were not known by these 21 men by whose orders such things were done. In one way, the fate of these men means little. Their personal power for evil lies forever broken. 
they have convicted and discredited each other and finally destroyed the legend they created around the figure of their leader. Their trial must form a milestone in the history of civilization, not only bringing retribution to these guilty men, but also the ordinary people of the world. And I make no distinction now between those who are friends and foes. The ordinary people of the world are now determined that the individual must transcend the states. You will remember when you come to give your decision the stories of these murders, but not only in vengeance, but in a determination that these things shall not occur again. Article 24J provides that each defendant may make a statement to the tribunal. I therefore now call upon the defendants who wish, whether they wish to make the statements. Defendant Herman Wilhelm Goering. The prosecution uses the fact that I was the second man of the state as proof that I must have known everything that happened. But it does not present any documentary or other convincing proof in cases where I have denied under oath that I knew about certain things or even desired them. Repeatedly, we have heard here how the worst crimes were veiled with the utmost secrecy. I wish to state expressly that I condemn utterly these terrible mass murders, and so that there shall be no misunderstanding in this connection, I wish to state emphatically and quite clearly once more before the High Tribunal that I have never decreed the murder of a single individual at any time, nor decreed other atrocities nor tolerated them while I had the power and the knowledge to prevent them. I stand behind the things that I have done, but I deny most emphatically that my actions were dictated by the desire to subjugate foreign peoples or to commit atrocities or crimes. The only motive which guided me was my ardent love for my people and my desire for their happiness and freedom. And for this, I call on the Almighty and my German people as well. Besides repeating the old accusations, the prosecution claims that we all attended secret conferences in order to plan a war of aggression. Besides that, we are supposed to have ordered the alleged murder of 12 million people. These accusations are described as genocide, the murder of people this connection, I wish to summarize as follows. I know my conscience to be completely free from any such guilt. I attempted to improve the physical and spiritual conditions of their existence, instead of destroying their personal security and human dignity. The thought of a physical annihilation of Slavs and Jews, that is to say the actual murder of entire peoples, has never entered my mind. I was of the opinion that the existing Jewish question would have to be solved by the creation of a minority right, emigration, or by settling Jews in a national territory. The white paper of the British government of 24 July 1946 shows how historical developments can bring about measures which were never previously planned. I understood my struggle, just as it was understood by many thousands of my comrades to be one conducted for the noblest idea, an idea which had been fought for under flying banners for over a hundred years. And may it please the tribunal, Hitler and the collapse of his system had brought a time of tremendous suffering upon the German people. 
the useless continuation of the war and the unnecessary destruction make the work of reconstruction more difficult. Privation and misery have come to the German people. After this trial, the German people will despise and condemn Hitler as the proved author of its misfortune. But the world will learn from these happenings not only to hate dictatorship as a form of government, but to fear it. Hitler's dictatorship differed in one fundamental point from all its predecessors of history. His was the first dictatorship in the present period of modern technical development, a dictatorship which made a complete use of all technical means in a perfect manner for the domination of his own country. Through technical devices like the radio and the loudspeaker, 80 million people were deprived of independent thought. It was thereby possible to subject them to the will of one man. The telephone, teletype, and radio made it possible, for instance, that orders from the highest sources could be transmitted directly to the lowest ranking units by whom, because of the high authority, they were carried out without criticism. Therefore, the more technical the world becomes, the more necessary is the promotion of individual freedom and the individual's awareness of himself as a counterbalance. In five to ten years, the technique of warfare will make it possible to fire rockets from continent to continent with uncanny precision. By atomic fission, it can destroy one million people in the center of New York in a matter of seconds. Science is able to spread pestilence among human beings and animals and to destroy crops by insect warfare. Chemistry has developed terrible weapons with which it can inflict unspeakable suffering upon helpless human beings. This trial must contribute towards preventing such degenerate wars in the future and towards establishing rules whereby human beings can live together. Of what importance is my own fate after everything that has happened in comparison with such a high goal? It's not war alone which shapes the history of humanity, but also in a higher sense, the cultural achievements which one day will become the common property of all humanity. But a nation which believes in its future will never perish. May God protect Germany and the culture. On October 1st, 1946, after 315 days of trial, the sentences were pronounced. Hermann Wilhelm Goering, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Joachim von Ribbentrop, death by hanging. Fritz Sauko, death by hanging. Julius Streicher, death by hanging. Wilhelm Frick, death by hanging. Hans Frank, death by hanging. Alfred Rosenberg, death by hanging. Wilhelm Keitel, death by hanging. Ernst Gautenbrunner, death by hanging. Also sentenced to death were Yodel, Seiss Inquart, and Martin Bormann, who was tried in absentia. Hess, Funk, and Rader got life prison terms. Speer, von Schirach, von Neurath, and Dernitz got long sentences. Many of the defendants were found guilty. This is Arthur Gates reporting from Nuremberg for the Combined American Network. I was an eyewitness to the execution of the wilted, spoiled flower of Nazidom but I only saw ten Nazis die. Wilhelm Hermann Goering, guilty on all four counts, the man whom Justice Jackson described as half militarist and half gangster, escaped his fate of hanging by committing suicide at 10.45 last night, less than three hours before he would have been executed. Nuremberg stands firmly against the resignation of man to the inhumanity of man. This brings us to the point. 
that the really the most important thing that was achieved at Nuremberg was not the conviction of these men and not the sentences imposed, but the determination for history that waging aggressive war is a crime.